Good afternoon, everybody. Let me ask my debaters, the teams, to come forward and come up and take their seats. I'm Dr. Peter Kilmarks. I'm the Deputy Director of the Fogarty International Center at the U.S. National Institutes of Health. And it's my great pleasure and honor to be able to be the, the moderator, the chair, for our traditional opening day Oxford debate. We, we want our, our second debaters also to come forward. Here they are. Terrific. So as I've asked our debate teams, our purpose is to both inform, but also to engage you as the audience. We've had some terrific presentations today, so we really want to close on a high note and bring up the energy in the room before we go to our reception. I've asked our debate teams to be vigorous advocates for their side, so they may not necessarily believe or agree with what they're arguing, but as, as great Oxford debaters, they're going to be vigorous advocates for the views that they're putting forward. And I've also encouraged them, if they want to engage in a little friendly uh, criticism or trash talk of the other side, that they're, uh, they're welcome to do so. But let me ask, while I'm speaking, can you please uh, put up the slide with the link for the voting? Um, and please get out your devices and enter this uh, website link into your, there we go. Um, I don't know if you can get the QR code from there. Oh, I guess you're gonna have to get the QR code from there since we don't actually have a fuller link. Oh, I guess you can go to menti.com and enter the code. But please, um, for our, our voting, we're, we're deep into the 21st century. We're gonna use this method for our voting for the debate. And so our, our proposition for today, um, and this is in the program, so make sure you read it and, and get it exactly right. The proposition for the debate is that unvaccinated people should be denied access to public spaces to prevent COVID-19 transmission within the African context. So, so there it is on the screen. And please, let's, let's go back to that slide with the, uh, with the QR code and with the website just to be sure that people get that. So for our agenda, we're, we're going to have um, first the, the first speakers for and against the proposition will speak for seven minutes each. And then we're gonna have the, um, debate from the floor. So this is where you all come in. You're gonna have uh, time uh, for, for you from the floor to argue, to speak for uh, your view for or against the proposition. That's gonna be a full 22 minutes. So plenty of time to hear from you. And then we'll have the second speakers for and against the proposition um, speaking for four minutes each. Uh, then we'll have two minutes each for the rebuttals from the first speakers. And then we'll have the final voting and closing. So um, in a minute, we will have the vote. Um, first, let me introduce our speakers. Oh, let me just also say, so the, the way we'll, we'll uh, tell who is the winner of the debate, it's gonna be the change in the percentile of the voting. So if, for example, the vote is 60-40, for and against at the beginning, and at the ending, the vote is then 56-44, the 44 will be the winner, even though it's, it's lower in number, it will have had an increase in the percentage. So it's, it's really how skillful the teams are and how you are from the floor in changing the minds of others in the room. So actually, um, uh, you can go ahead and oh, let's please open the voting. And while I'm introducing the speakers, you can go ahead and start, uh, start with your votes. And so for the first speaker, the first speaker for the proposition is Dr. Nelson Sewankambo. He's from the uh, Makerere Medical School here in Uganda. I, in the interest of time, these are uh, very uh, distinguished, accomplished debaters. I'm not gonna go through their, their full bios. They are in the, in the book, in the back of the book, and I encourage you to read them there. I'm, I'm just gonna have um, simple introductions. Uh, so uh, Dr. Sewankambo is our first speaker for the proposition. Our first speaker against the proposition is uh, Dr. Francois Venter. He's from Izincha, from the University of Witzwatersrand in South Africa. Our second speaker for the proposition is Dr. Nicholas Nanyinya, who is from the University, I'm so sorry, from the Ministry of Health, Central Public Health Laboratories here in Uganda. And then our second speaker against the proposition 
is Esther Bayiga, who's from the School of Public Health at Makerere University here in Uganda. So we'll give you another minute to enter your vote um, for or against this proposition, agree or disagree with this proposition, and we'll close the voting in, uh, in just a minute, and then we'll show before we get started what the, uh, where we stand. If you have two devices, I'll leave it to your own ethics whether to, uh, to vote twice. Um, so just another few seconds, and then we're going to display the results of the pre-debate results of the voting, and then um, with that, we'll then go ahead to our first speaker, uh, uh, who will have seven minutes um, for the proposition. So let's go ahead and show the results of the voting. The voting is closed, and we have a 70-30 split, or a 30-70 split, so the majority of, of you disagree with the proposition that unvaccinated people should be denied access. And with that, let me turn the podium over to Dr. Sewan Combo. Mr. Chair and participants, the results of that we have just seen actually reflect very well about infodemic that infodemic has done its job to mislead people, even the more enlightened people like those in this room. <laughs> and therefore, I have a big task to convince you that what you believe in right now is wrong. <laughs> Permit me to speak from my heart um, I don't have slides to show. Let me speak from the heart instead of speaking from the brain. So far, vaccinations are the single most effective control measure against COVID, uh, the COVID pandemic, with its variants of concern. We all know that. For the great majority of the public, vaccinations pose only a small inconvenience compared to the alternate interventions, including no vaccination at all. However, new waves and future COVID-like global epidemics remain a great concern, especially because of the large unvaccinated populations. The large unvaccinated populations we have all gone through the COVID pandemic, and we know how it has devastated our lives. And therefore, we should not sympathize with the unvaccinated populations. Africa is the world's least vac vaccinated continent, with about 11% of the continent's 1.3 billion people fully jabbed. Are you proud to belong to this continent? I am certainly not. Only six of Africa's 54 countries had made a global target of vaccinating 40% of their populations against COVID by the end of last year. And this is according to WHO. Brothers and sisters, Africans from Africa, wake up. This is a wake-up call. We need to own our future, preserve our humanity and dignity as a continent, and not always be the laughing stock because of having the worst health performance indicators. We need to take bold steps and own our future and our health. Today, the world is bewildered and murmuring. You hear murmurs as to why Africa was not as devastated by the pandemic as had been predicted. Africa has therefore excelled in that severe disease has affected the least proportion of its population. We need to keep surprising the world. Why shouldn't we keep surprising the world? As we've done 
in that we are not as devastated as the people had predicted. We need to keep the world envious of, Afri of what Africa does and does better than others, meaning leading the world. We need to keep surprising them. Caesarean sections were done in this country where we are before the Europeans came here. Those were bold steps. And yet today, we cannot take bold steps, shame on us. <laughs> if we creatively embrace vaccines, we can do even much better to accelerate health, socioeconomic development, and recovery from the ravages of the pandemic. Making a decision to vaccinate or not to vaccinate is not an individual or personal decision. It is a decision concerning the collective. Why? Because unvaccinated people are not a risk to themselves alone, but also to vaccinated people. So when they threaten the health of the vaccinated ones, we need to keep the world, as I said, uh, on its toes. Let us be unanimous in this house. After weighing the risks and anticipated benefits of restricting people's right of association, I think this is what we are going to hear from those who are opposing this proposition, that we are taking away the right of association. However, unvaccinated people when they are causing, they raise potential for harm to others, they should not claim any rights of association because they are putting others in danger. Restricting their access to public places is the least innocuous and least intrusive, but most effective measure to motivate vaccination. We need vaccinated people to make up the, by far the largest proportion of the general population on this continent. Some will argue, it's not sustainable to, to ask unvaccinated people to stay away from public places. We are talking about bold states. We have had arguments before and let me go through some. 30 seconds. 30 seconds. <laughs> they said it was not sustainable for us to have antiretrovirus, that we couldn't take antiretrovirus because we had no watches. And the list goes on, that there would be rampant uh, viral resistance because of using antivirals on this continent. Where are we today? Please tell me. So we need to trash what people say we can't do, and we should be able to do them. Thank you very much. Against the proposition, Dr. Venter. <laughs> Prof. So my first slide, my opponent's already cheating. He's not talking about um, SARS-CoV-2 vaccines. He's talking about all vaccines and you went over time. So Peter, I'm just pointing this out. Um, so I'm going to talk about very specifically though about the SARS-CoV-2 vaccines. And I'm going to argue it's not just about the African context, it's all contexts, that we shouldn't be using the vaccines as an entry point for access to public places. And be, importantly, we're not debating whether these um, that co around COVID seriousness. We've all seen terrible, terrible catastrophe amongst, uh, in terms of death, in terms of long COVID and disability. And we're not debating the vaccine's efficacy. I think that we've seen these are, we've heard today, the, uh, these are modern miracles. So um, this is not what we're debating. We're talking about specifically, are unvaccinated people a danger to other people? We know that SARS-CoV-2 is a respiratory virus and it's respiratory spread. Surface spread is actually very, very rare if it occurs at all. Um, 
the spread is also almost entirely indoors. So firstly, asking for vaccinated, unvaccinated people to present some sort of passport at the door for outdoor events is stupid to begin with. So firstly, we need to start narrowing it down to indoor thing. And one of the most important protections we have is ventilation. In fact, ventilation is far more important than the homeopathy you're wearing on your face at the moment, Julia, versus what um, Quez is wearing, which is an N95 mask, which is the only mask that actually has been shown to be beneficial in terms of the Omicron. And that's because Omicron, probably Delta, but Omicron has changed everything we understand in terms of SARS-CoV-2. In fact, um, Omicron's pretty much vaccinated the world. For all our government's uselessness and our donors' uselessness in providing vaccines, Omicron's done that for them because it is so infectious. Delta was very, very infectious. Omicron and its various variants now, B4 and B5, are so much more infectious. And we now know that these masks need to be N95 or better. These like surgical masks, these cloth masks, they do nothing. They are more for appearances than anything else. You need to have them properly fitted or they just actually we have good scientific evidence for that at the moment. This old thing about 15 minutes, two meters, Omicron laughs at that. It just d d dances past it. We haven't talked about that for probably a year now because Omicron and Delta even has made that a, a, a laughing stock. Vaccines provide um, some very mild benefit for a very, very brief period of time. And we've, I'm gonna show you the data now. For people who've received infection, who've become infected, they're not going to transmit the virus and not going to receive the virus for a, probably, they're not going to become infected again for a few weeks and months. So I've just recovered from COVID. I'm not, probably not going to get COVID for a few weeks. So I'm, I'm protected from that. I'm also not going to transmit COVID um, onwards um, for the period that I actually was infectious for just a very brief period of time. This, um, the other thing we need to think about is how many people have had COVID at the moment. Uh, which is a form of vaccination. This is just, the, uh, so we, let's go to a really rich country, America. Look what Omicron did there from January. It just vaccinated the whole country. All those anti-vaxxers in America, tough luck for you. We vaccinated you for uh, against your will. In South Africa, um, before COVID, 70% of the, almost 70% of the population was already infected by the time Omicron came away. After Omicron was finished with us, 93%, even with vaccination, people were infected. So you've got two countries, one in Africa, Northern America, um, pretty much everybody's been infected um, by the time we get around there. This paper, which came out earlier this year in one of the Lancet Stables came, um, publications, demonstrated that in vaccinated versus unvaccinated populations, there was no protection given to the household when people were vaccinated or they were unvaccinated. People got it um, irrespective um, of, of their vaccination status. And this is really important data because it suggests to us, what it did, was interesting about this paper is they looked at the viral kinetics. The viral load of people who, have, um, who got, um, who were infected actually was exactly the same whether they were vaccinated or unvaccinated with Delta. And there's data now with Omicron as well showing the viral load in those first five days is pretty much the same thing. The decay is quicker if you're vaccinated, which um, we haven't got data yet on people being infected, but it's probably the same thing. Um, and, but within the household, people just got infected anyway. So vaccination is not providing any protection within the, in the, in the households. Omicron, this was done during Delta. Omicron now is so much more infectious and pretty much the, um, has the same viral kinetics. Suggests to me that actually the vaccinations are not providing protection to the people within the household. There's an NAGM paper that's just come out. There's a very interesting preprint that, had, um, that came out and then got slightly modified, which when you read the fine print, there's a really interesting commentary in nature around this. On the face of it, it looks very, but it's very similar. It suggests that actually there's very, very little benefit to actually doing this. We asked about vaccinations and asking you for your proof. You don't need any proof in Africa. No one's vaccinated. So you can ask it. If you go into Canada, you go to Australia, you go to Netherlands, everyone's vaccinated. You don't need proof at the door as to whether you need to access public spaces. And that's because donors, governments, um, all the people responsible for vaccination haven't done their jobs. Everybody now has immunity. Those people who didn't have immunity, weren't infected, didn't have vaccination, they are extinct, they're gone. Um, th there is no such thing anymore. Everybody has now got high, and increasingly we've got hybrid immunity. We've either got vaccination or infection, or you go infection and you're getting vaccinated. And this idea of immunity crossover is just um, something which is completely, completely gone. Um, so now, if, why do we need to please everyone if everyone is immune? Why do we need to have um, people coming in and out of all of this? It's really important that we understand that trust is essential in public health, and it's undermined when people 
we start asking for practical things. Are we going to ask for people to be showing these vaccine passports at every single public event, like coming through the door every single time that we come through here, every time we go to a taxi rank? Why only vaccines? Why not masks? Why don't we ask the, everybody to open the windows? Why do we not have the police checking at every single thing? Um, why do, are we going to do this on public transport? In South Africa, 60% of people get on a taxi every single day. Are we going to do that every single day? It just seems it's not. And then it's hypocritical. In South Africa, our, public, our politicians have unmasked political rallies, but now they want us to like, show vaccine passports at every single point. <laughs> it just doesn't make sense. And then you undermine the whole, all the public health stuff that we know works. So I, I see I've got a few seconds. So this is the only real, real reason to this is to punish people, um, to my mind. And the people who actually should be held responsible or not. So in summary, um, vaccinations are minimally responsible against slowing transmission. Mandates are a distraction from pu proper public health. And we should be reserving these things for extremely vulnerable people only, not um, as a mechanism to actually punish people going forward. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Venter. The, the floor is now open for debate. Let's, let's get our microphone carriers, get plenty of steps on their Fitbits. Please raise your hand when you, when you want to make a comment. Let me ask you to identify yourself and your institution and to be brief, under one minute. This is not speeches, this is just sharing your own views, your own opinion. Get those hands up. Yes, microphone Thank you very too. much. I, I think the point is, why don't we learn? You don't force people to do things. People should be given full information and they make an informed decision. Secondly, didn't we learn from the HIV world that for example, when we forced mothers to go and test for HIV, they did not do it. But when we placed them at the center, when we told them the importance, they did it. So public health, desires that human rights are put at the center. But the other question is, are we saying that Africans are refusing vaccines? Didn't we cry for these vaccines? Are we forgetting the inequality that came with vaccines? So now that the vaccines have come, we are being told we are refusing vaccines. No, we are not refusing vaccines, but the inequality is real. So we need to start from there. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Let's go now to microphone one. Please, please uh, introduce yourself before you speak. Uh, okay, again, uh, Akim uh, from Malawi, Lighthouse. Uh, quickly, under one minute, I think it's premature to be discussing forcing people to be vaccinated or not allowing anyone who is not vaccinated to access public services. I think we should look at the means before we justify the end. Uh, why I'm saying so, let's improve access to vaccines. Let's make it available even to hard to reach areas. Then you can start thinking of probably making it mandatory that once you are not vaccinated, then you can't access public services. Thank you, over. Let's go to microphone two. Get your hand up if you wanna ask a question. So I'm Rita from Nigeria. Um, in Africa, more than 70% of the population live under poverty, live in poverty. So they live from hand to mouth on a daily basis and they live outdoors because they only go home to sleep. Most of their habitations are not habitable for them to stay indoors all day. So if they're going to be out, they're outdoors all day, like the speaker, the last speaker said, What's the essence of vaccinating them when they're already vaccinated? They would die from hunger before COVID-19 will kill them. In, uh, I mean, it's really practicable. It's not, it's not attainable in our situation where we live outdoors majority of the time in our lifetimes. And then I, I would have loved to know how does the vulnerable population we are talking about here, the HIV population, do they need vaccine? The, those that are not immunologically suppressed, do they need vaccine? Should we keep them out till they get vaccinated? And if we vaccinate them, those with advanced HIV disease, will they mount a response? 
Thank you, Rita. A microphone one. Thank you so much. I'm again Yeru Sachiria from Makerere University, Behavioral Social Sciences Program. I think behavior does not occur in a vacuum. Behavior is guided by so many things, and the social sciences world has done a great job in helping us understand through the theories of behavior. I think more than ever before, yes, Africa has to take bold steps, but I think we need to leverage on the social sciences programs to, to get the best results. It has been proven from the HIV world that the biomedical interventions that integrated social sciences research focusing on behavior have had higher uptakes and greater impact. I think for the COVID vaccine, it's time to leverage on the behavioral social sciences program. Thank you. Thank you very much. Over to microphone two. Um, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Ms. Nalomba. I'm from FHI 360 Zambia. I uh, just want to agree with the previous speaker um, on COVID vaccination. There is need to um, expand on health promotion on COVID vaccination among the low socioeconomic status population, because that's where majority of the population in Africa are. So the same efforts that have been done on HIV it's the same efforts that needs to be done on COVID information. People lack information on COVID. They don't see the essence of being vaccinated. They don't see the impacts that COVID has on one's life. So this is why majority of the African population are not getting vaccinated, because like the other previous speaker mentioned, they live from hand to mouth. Now, if we put restriction to public places, for the people that depend on selling in the streets, in the markets, what will happen to their livelihood? What will happen to their social income? So it's important we need to expand on behavioral change, uh, communication, and this will not take us one day, to net take us one month, but it should be an ongoing on process, and they need to intensify on that. Thank you. Thank you. We're gonna go now to microphone one. If you want to speak, raise your hand, but you're, you're trying to attract the attention of the microphone runner. Thank Go you. ahead, microphone one. Thank you, Justice Mohanj is my name. One of the most important public spaces that every person must access is a hospital or a health facility. And we know, everybody in this room, that there are many diseases that kill people much more than COVID. So for you even think about denying people who are not vaccinated public spaces is equivalent to genocide. <laughs> After all, we know that the mortality rate or the fatality rate of COVID is much, much lower than many other diseases. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. There were two people Yes, you're on. Go ahead, microphone one. Is the battery? Oh, OK. Uh, less, less radical than genocide here. Please but, introduce yourself. Um, Ahmed Dungu from Infectious Diseases Institute. And I have two quick concerns. One is uh, uh, I think science should be science. And uh, we should not force narrative in science. So I believe that as a scientific community, we need to be more patient. And these are two concerns that I raise. So the first one is both sides. And this is the immunity of COVID. So right now, we have evidence of infection of COVID. But we do not have enough evidence to show that uh, Delta, Omicron have yielded neutralizing antibodies to actually prevent uh, infection. So I think the vaccine, non-vaccine. Uh, there is a paper we discussed in our journal club about two months ago, and they were trying to study the, how much uh, vaccines and natural immunity induce, uh, induce uh, immunity. So the benefit, the vaccine, if you get COVID like Delta heat us so badly, 
we don't know if it finds me, if the disease finds me so diseased, does my body mount an immune response to create and neutralizing antibodies to prevent subsequent infection? I don't know that yet. Then the other thing is there's a benefit in uh, the, immunize, the vaccine because of persistent antigenic presentation. Because if you give me a short one and you prime my immune system, then they showed in that paper, it was a small study, but they showed that at two months, when you repeated antigenic presentation, the T cells were able to mount a large spike in utilizing antibodies. So that created a concern, that was, uh, they were studying Pfizer, and that showed a bit the difference that the natural infection gives you one chance of a, an infection. If you get mild disease, you may mount a robust infection. But if you get severe disease into ICU, do you actually mount the same immunity as me who was in the Kampala streets? As we know, many people didn't even know they got COVID. So that's why I'm saying, okay. can we as scientists demonstrate Th immunity? Th thank you. Uh, one last one is- R Please wrap up. Oh, okay. Last I wrap up by saying that when, the, when we rolled out vaccines here in Kampala, the, just speaking about adverse effects, effects of a vaccine was considered being an anti-vaxxer. Our own uh, ministry didn't collect data very early. We had chance to speak with the rest of the world, but so w science should not force narrative. I think we should explore narrative both ways. Over. Thank, Thank you for that, for that. Microphone two, please. Please introduce yourself. Thank you. I'm Josh smith -Strain. I'm with CDC in Malawi. Uh, just to echo some of my colleagues, I think equity should be at the center of this discussion. Um, so thinking about the populations in the countries we're representing, uh, a majority live in rural settings, in, um, in poverty, and these are often the populations that haven't yet been vaccinated by COVID. If they are further excluded from public spaces, including hospitals, wouldn't this um, you know, uh, increase uh, or de decrease their health outcomes um, in, in these populations? So we need to think about equity at the center of this and really systematically understand the populations that aren't getting vaccinated in our context before um, putting a ban on any types of populations. Uh, so just put it, pushing for equity. Thank you for that. Microphone one, please. Hi, um, my name is Samira Saini Mohammed. I'm with um, Henry Jackson Foundation. Um, I would want to echo what most of the speakers have said. Um, for instance, in Nigeria, we were supposed to be a part of the Sanofi COVID um, clinical trial. Um, when we went out for community engagement, a lot of people were very hesitant. They didn't want to take the vaccines. And um, so I realized, because I was part of the team that went out, and then I said, okay, Moderna came, nobody wanted Moderna. Pfizer came and you said, no, you didn't want that. Um, and the reason is because most people felt left out, especially Africa on the whole, um, we were left out when the vaccines actually came in, and so there was no equity. And so when it came, people, there were some propagandas, people were saying, oh, it's expiring in the United States, and so they want to give us those expired ones. And I had to say, listen, this is Sanofi. You can help us. This is Africa. Come together. Let's see if we can get a vaccine that suits us. And that was how we were able to gain their trust. Another one was the incentive. A lot of people are hungry. We have low, um, low earners that cannot stay at home. People need to go out every day on a daily basis to actually get food. So because of the incentive that we're going to give them, a lot of people were ready to take those vaccines. We had a pool of about 596 participants who really wanted to take the Sanofi vaccine. So um, trust is one thing, like the last speaker had said. So I think based on my own experience, I, I, I don't think banning people from public spaces will actually even help because people wouldn't just even stay home because they need to go out. Thank you. Thank you. We'll, we'll go ahead to microphone two. So we, ha we haven't heard from the 30% of you who voted for the, the proposition. So please uh, go ahead and speak up. Don't be stigmatized. Microphone two, please. My name is Krista Satkwase uh, from Joint Clinical Research Center here in Uganda. My discussion or my question is, should it be a stone cast or 
because I double as a practitioner and a researcher and reports from the practice community have proved something new to me. After taking care of a patient in intensive care unit for about 15 days who is fully vaccinated, uh, unfortunately is unable to make it, passes away, he's a father to a family, and you're in a family conference, you want to explain that it would have been worse if he had not vaccinated. How do you explain it? And you, for example, uh, a personal experience, I had my first shot in April, another one around November, then never contracted anything like Alpha, Delta, but in January I got Omicron, fully vaccinated. So the question is, is it a stone in a cast? Thank you very much. Microphone one, please. Uh, please, please my name is Sabrina yourself. Chitaka, I am a pediatrician, and I'd like all of us to seriously ask this question, what is a public space? Schools are public spaces, and we have seen how when children are not vaccinated and they get COVID, as a parent, we all panic. We look at Premier League, I support Chelsea, and when there were no crowds in those stadiums, Football was boring. But I want to tell you that people in Europe and in the United States who have access to vaccines are able to go to those places because they have access to vaccines. I would like to say that let us ban people from public spaces who have not been vaccinated in retaliation to the inequality. Let us demand for access to vaccines so that we all get vaccinated. The last question I'd like to ask all of you in this room, are you vaccinated? Thank you. We'll go now to microphone two. Hello there, my name is Imogen. I am um, from for the Botswana Harvard Partnership. Um, I think that whenever designing a public health intervention, you must consider the opportunity cost and so would it not be best to spend the money doing anything else? Thank you. Thank you for being short and sweet. Uh, microphone one. Oh, I'm Teodosia Escoli from Liberia National AIDS Commission. My concern is that um, being vaccinated is so key when it comes to people getting vaccinated because if all of us can uh, get vaccinated from BCG, poliomyelitis. We follow the, the procedure in getting the vaccines available. Why not COVID vaccine? So it's key that if we have that importance of the vaccine that we took to prevent poliomyelitis, measles, it should be part of the system. But the most important thing is that we need to create more awareness and tell the people the importance of the vaccine. Thank you. Thank you. Microphone two, please. Hi, my name is Nuha Nakvi, and I work with uh, the Center for Disease Control in South Africa. And I'd like to second what my colleague just said. Um, if you look at us entering uh, this country, many of us needed to have the yellow fever vaccine in order to enter Uganda. Um, in the United States, in order to attend public school, you must have the MMR vaccine. In order to attend a lot of public colleges, you need to be vaccinated against meningitis. These are all required vaccinations. How come we're not having that same conversation? We're, we're willing to accept those mandatory vaccinations. Why is that not the same for COVID-19? Thank you. Thank you. Okay, we have a few minutes left and a few more hands, so let's uh, continue and, and please be brief. Microphone one, please. Hi, I'm uh, Josh Parker Allen from Oxford University. Um, we can talk about all, all sorts of issues regarding this proposition, but to me, most of it is moot when it's not even realistic to enforce a vaccination mandate. What are the state's options for dealing with those that disregard the mandate? Imprisonment, fines, beating, or forcible vaccination? 
Imprisonment is costly and impractical. Fines and beating are completely inhumane, and forcible vaccination creates all kinds of enforcement issues. We've seen forcible vaccination in some parts of Uganda. A friend of mine living on Lake Albert and regularly moving between Uganda and DRC has been vaccinated nine times with Johnson & Johnson. Um, Dr. Sewan Camp, because he keeps forgetting his vaccination pass. Dr. Sewan Cambo um, has talked about bold scientific steps that need to be taken. Um, does nine doses of Johnson & Johnson uh, constitute a bold scientific step? <laughs> Microphone two, please. Just a couple minutes left. Thank you very much. Um, my name is Cassandra Mebo, and I'm um, doing a bachelor's in nursing science, and I'm in my fourth year. And I support that unvaccinated people should not be denied access, no, should be denied access in public places, but we should pause, we should first think of uh, a few things, and then we can go ahead and deny people to, uh, to access public places. First of all, we should think of availability. Uh, I've at least worked in three hospitals, I mean practicing, but the moment they bring vaccines within one week or even before people have already known, they are done. Uh, I will give an experience. When we were coming here, I had taken one shot and they requested us to get another shot. I had taken one shot of AstraZeneca. But when I went to over four hospitals in southwestern Uganda, they didn't have the vaccines. It's not that I, di I didn't want to take a vaccine, but there was no availability of the vaccine. So before you deny us to come in the public places, you should first to know, is it really the problem that people do not want to get vaccinated, or it's because there, there, there are no vaccines around? And then my second point is... Uh, be very on, brief, we're almost done. Okay, okay. On the previous speakers, some, some speakers say that we should borrow a leaf from the previous infectious diseases and more so HIV. Uh, when HIV came, I don't know, I, I think I was not yet born, but <laughs> they used the, the different measures and they, they helped people. Uh, they, for example, they provided the different preventive measures and because people were sensitized and they were aware of the dangers of the, of the HIV, they adopted to these uh, measures. So I'm thinking that instead of denying these people, we should do more awareness and people get to know. For example... Nope, uh, I'm going to stop you there. Thank you very much. Our no, last, last speaker last, uh, will be microphone one. I'm Noma Temba from Ezincha in South Africa. And my question is directed to Prof Fenter for him to comment on vaccination mandates and long COVID and all its complications in African populations that we do not know of yet. Thank you very much to all of you for your interventions from the floor. This has been a very robust debate. You'll have to save any more questions or comments. You can take it up over, uh, over a drink at our reception following, following the debate. So we'll go now to our second speaker for the proposition Dr. Naninya from uh, Uganda. Okello was a five-year-old young innocent boy who got a malaria episode. And upon getting the episode, his grandmother, who was the caretaker, rushed him to the hospital. When he reached the hospital, he was given basic treatment for malaria, and he started improving. But one of the nurses was coughing. And after some time, the grandmother also started coughing. And when the grandmother coughed, she wasn't. Eventually, she was diagnosed with COVID-19. And after a few days, she passed away. Meanwhile, Okello, who had improved because the caretaker had passed away, also regained the malaria. And he deteriorated and passed away. May his soul rest in peace. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, how many more lives that are innocent can we afford to lose 
in the disguise of protecting the so-called human rights due to vaccine hesitancy? Don't those who die innocently due to our negligence and hesitancy have a right to live? Gentlemen in the building, how many of you will allow to put a finger in a hole that has termites? They tell you put a finger and you put it there and then. If none of you can, then like we say in Uganda, tulimumbozizamara, meaning that we are just in stories of boozing. We have to take action. We are talking about human rights, but public health through the principles of ethics mandates us to protect the community through beneficence to ensure that the policies we bring on are able to protect our communities. And if we restrict people from accessing public places, then we shall be able to prevent them from contracting COVID. non malfeasance if we allow unvaccinated people at a risk of getting COVID to write around, we are going to cause harm. And then finally, justice. Ladies and gentlemen, it's high time we took the mantle. In the 16th century, George Washington, whom most of us praise, instituted a mandate for all soldiers to be vaccinated against smallpox. And that's when Americans started their fight against smallpox. But here we are seated saying that people should be allowed to write around. <laughs> as I conclude, ladies and gentlemen, as I conclude, in an African traditional ceremony, the son-in-law will never be told to undress to show his manhood. But everyone in that ceremony knows that manhood is so important in this marriage. And if they give out their daughter-in-law and the manhood has a problem, the marriage won't be sustained. It's a similar case here. All of us, we know that we can't survive without vaccination. And we know that we Africans are like gods. Actually, what I'm projecting there is our own saying that you have to force a god to the world, though it is for its own benefit. Ladies and gentlemen, let's have mandates and restrict people to access public places and spaces so that we are able to, uh, to curb COVID-19. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Naninya. I don't, I don't know if that was sorghum beer or banana beer, but that looked very jolly. We'll now go to our final speaker, the second speaker against the proposition, uh, Esther Baiga from Makarere. So this is in addition to what everyone in the audience that opposes this motion has said, as well as the first speaker for the opposition. Some of the ethical considerations that we need to look at are first of all, necessity and proportionality. We have to consider whether mandatory vaccination is necessary and proportional to achieve the public health goals. So we are looking at vaccine effectiveness against transmission and as already specified, we know that it's not as effective against the, the transmission. So why do we need to go that mandatory way? And then the second point, again, the ethics require that there should be sufficient evidence on vaccine safety, efficacy, and effectiveness. But up until now, there have been very few trials that have been done in Africa. We have had some in South Africa, and then Egypt had a trial going on. Uganda also started on one. But really, Africa on the whole have, has had very few trials. And why is Africa different? While we have a very huge population, larger than North America and Europe combined, we are very genetically diverse and have unique environmental exposures that expose our body responses to drugs and vaccines. Africa also has a huge young population, and yet there's not sufficient data on COVID vaccine, 19 vaccine efficiency when it comes to children. 
and also that some African countries have high rates of commodity, comorbidities such as HIV and tuberculosis for which COVID-19 vaccines need to be tested for their efficacy and safety. Another ethical consideration is sufficient supply, and I'm re-echoing this because you have talked about it. In Uganda, you very well know that at some point, people were even given water, and they walked away and thought they had been vaccinated, which was very unfortunate. In the absence of a sufficient, reliable vaccine supply that would, would, would permit every eligible member of the general public to be vaccinated, a mandate for the general public would fail to address the ethical consideration, you know, of sufficient supply, you know? And we have had issues of access, you know? Someone has mentioned bouncing all over and not being able to get the vaccine. And when it comes to inequality, which is a very big uh, consideration ethically, we then leave out the vulnerable populations we have had pregnant women in some hospitals being told before they can access antenatal care, they need to be vaccinated. And that's very, that's very um, unfortunate because that's misuse of the mandate already. That's not even passed, you know? And then public trust, lastly. Ethics require that there should be public trust, that the mandate should not threaten the public trust. And we've had issues of propaganda, do they want to kill us? Is Big Pharma on our side, you know? So making it mandatory raises the questions, you know, that have been spoken. So to cut it short, we are not ready for this to go the mandatory route, and we strongly oppose the motion. Thank you. We'll now go to our closing rebuttal statements. Uh, Dr. Sewankambo, followed by Dr. Venter, you have two minutes each. Mr. Chair, what we've had this afternoon or this evening shows some degree of misadventure that people have indulged in. Why? Because many of them have missed the point. The point wasn't that when you deny unvaccinated people to public places, access to public places, that the other interventions against COVID are wiped away and you don't let them utilize masks and so on and so forth. They go hand in hand. They have, this is an addition to whatever other interventions you put in place. Secondly, when I hear people comparing HIV and COVID, my heart bleeds. I've been in HIV for more than 30 years. If you got, COVID, uh, if you got uh, HIV last night, it will show up some years down the road, and it will take a number of years to kill you. COVID, if any of us has got COVID from here, and is one of those who develops severe disease, next month, that person will not be with us. And therefore, to say, uh, educate people, uh, and so on and so forth, and wait. There's no time for waiting. We are dealing with an emergency. We are dealing with an emergency. Now, the other thing that I've had this afternoon, which I think is a misadventure, is an apparent suggestion that vaccines are not required because people are vaccinated from where they are, naturally. Therefore, it's not surprising to me that maybe the high-income countries had those whispers, and therefore that's why we didn't get enough vaccines, because they knew we didn't need them. <laughs> Mr. Chair, thank you very much. Dr. Venter, we'll give you an extra 20 seconds if you need it. Thank you. So, I'm disappointed that you know we weren't asked in the HIV world how to comment on this COVID thing because we've had calls for mandates forever. Get 
We must force everyone to know their status. We must force ARVs down their throats so they're not infectious. You know, this is not new to us, and this is why it's disappointing. Like, the donors and the pharma companies, they come parachute the vaccines into Africa, and they're like, why are they not queuing outside the airport, you know, to get their vaccinations? Then they, my government, for instance, it makes, the, it makes the vaccines available in a tiny number of clinics. They won't, why won't people travel for hours to come and get their vaccinations? Maybe the clinic's open, maybe it isn't, because everyone's on isolation and quarantine. It's, uh, maybe there's, there's their vaccine stockouts. Why don't they come? You know, they, but it's hesitancy. You know, it's not because uh, people have got jobs. They have to travel. They don't have money for travel. So it's very convenient for politicians to call it hesitancy when it's actually the uselessness of the system of delivery of the, of the vaccines. And we know this from HIV. Think about the HIV testing policies. We have to work hard for people to get tested. You have to take the testing to the community. You have to bring the testing close to people. You don't sit back and you just wait for them to come and get their testing. The same thing went for the vaccines. And we need to think about these mandates. This is a crude instrument for vaccine, for politician and public health incompetence in terms of providing the, uh, the vaccine. The reason Africa is not vaccinated is not because of hesitancy, it's because of the incompetence of the delivery systems of vaccines across Africa. And we need to make our peace with that before we start blaming the individuals for that and starting to punish them by saying you can't come through. I try to show you that vaccines provide no protection. Whether you're vaccinated or you're unvaccinated means nothing in terms of transmission. So putting that in place makes absolutely no sense to me. But we need to think harder about these mandates because it's get out of jail card for our politicians. It, they look good when they start putting in travel bans, when they make us fill in all these stupid forms at the airport, um, which we protect absolutely no one. And when they start putting together these other things, these tough things that make them look so good, we need to hold them accountable for the fact that these vaccination programs are not working and it's their fault, not the fault of the population. And that's when we start, um, when we start having a decent debate about these things. Thanks very much. Thank you to all of our debaters. Please go ahead and put the uh, information for the voting back up and please get out your devices, your device or your devices. And uh, please now, after you've heard from each other and from our debate teams, what is your view on the proposition? Again, the proposition, unvaccinated people should be denied access to public spaces to prevent COVID-19 transmission within the African context. So please vote either yes or no, go, go ahead and open the voting. I don't know if it's open. Yes? So please, we'll give you a minute or two to go ahead and record your votes. Is it working? Is the, can we please open the voting? Open, I get the thumbs up. Back to the QR code, please. Can you go back to the slide with the QR code? go ahead and thank our debate teams for very vigorous and well-informed <laughs> arguments and thank all of you the audience for your attention and your input this has been another great debate and we'll give you just another few seconds and then we'll go ahead. Raise your hand if you need more time. Okay. Okay. Time's up. Please go ahead and show the results from our great debate. Oh. <laughs> So, we spent two percent. Okay. Well, so we 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 don't see we don't see error bars. We we're not sure if this is statistically significant. But I'm going to congratulate uh, the team arguing against the proposition.
for gaining 2% in the proportion that agree with them, but thank all of our debaters and thank all of you for a fantastic session. Big round of applause.